conversation has been just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, just sitting here, I have been so filled and so edified. Um, I'm particularly delighted that our student, Sadia Anwar, was able to offer those just penetrating, extraordinary uh, observations. I was thinking that um, our students need to depart by five at the latest. Um, and so uh, what I want to do is I want to just share a few thoughts. And then I'd like to open up the end of the conference for our uh, just further discussion. I mean, what we had imagined was a, was a dialogue uh, catalyzed by some thinking on some, some, some basic issues. So I want to just share with you a few thoughts. I won't read my paper. I'll just share a few thoughts. Maybe I'll read a few excerpts here and there. Uh, and then we'll, we'll close the conference with, with a conversation. I think that uh, one of the greatest philosophers of the 20th century uh, was a, a German philosopher. He actually was trained as a psychiatrist and practiced as a psychiatrist for many years and then began to see the nasty hand of Nazism grip the throats of the people of Germany. And uh, he was so shaken by the brutality, by the inhumanity of even the great philosophers that were his friends in Heidelberg, mm -hmm. that he decided that he needed to make a more careful cultural analysis of what was going on in the world. And so he shifted his work from psychopathology as a psychiatrist to philosophy and history. And in a relatively short period of time, he became one of the greatest philosophers of history that the world had ever seen. He wrote um, a wonderful, wonderful classic work called uh, Jesus, Buddha, Confucius. And uh, he wrote a work called uh, The Psychology of World Views. He was one of the first philosophers, in fact, to give uh, structure to the concept of worldview. He said that in order for humans to survive, they absolutely have to have philosophy. Any culture that forgets philosophy becomes mired down in itself. He said philosophy is a process of thinking oneself free. And he said that if you want to know whether or not a society is dying, you just have to ask, are they consumed with pragmatic concerns? Are they fundamentally interested in bread and butter issues? He says as soon as society begins to conceptualize itself as having as its central duty the provision of resources for eating and drinking and sleeping, <coughs> that society is doomed. And so he said that every great society is philosophical. And he says that when the people go to sleep philosophically, they have to be awakened. And he says periodically, when humanity has slumbered, has fallen into a kind of a coma, he says there's a, a story of the deepest levels of human consciousness. And this story causes an abandonment of the worldview that had been animating the thinking of the people and with which they had fallen asleep. And he says that uh, he says that this uh, this awakening precipitates what he called an axial age in the thinking of the collective body of mankind. The first axial age that he described uh, he associated with the period between um, 800 and 200 BC. And he said that uh, 
there occurred in the world a tremor in the deepest recesses of the human imagination. And that in many, many di different parts of the world, this tremor uh, did shape human thought. He associated it with the coming of the Buddha in India, with the coming of Confucius and Lhasa in China, the prophets of Israel and Mesopotamia, and the great thinkers of Greece, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and with the coming of Zarathustra, Zoroaster in Persia. And he said that these great thinkers were so extraordinary because they caused us to think about who we were, where we were going, and what our purposes were anew. He gave us new, they gave us new conceptual thought with which to think about the process of civilization building. And because we were thinking with new conceptual categories, with new understandings of who we were, we were able to make very rapid progress in a very short period of time. I have to say that in the area of human rights, in the area of thinking about where we are on the planet, humanity has arrived at another axial age, at another axial period. A period in which it is no longer possible for us to take significant advancements forward without addressing deep philosophical profound ontological questions. And I think that one of the most important of these questions has to do with the simple question, what is the purpose of our lives? What is the purpose of life? And I think that the sciences are converging on a very simple view. The sciences are converging on the view that the purpose of life is development. And that development consists of not only the creation of the material conditions necessary for the maintenance of the physical body of mankind, but requires the cultivation and refinement of what the ancients referred to as the human spirit. And it's, lo it's largely in protection of the human spirit that the human rights movement was born. It was not to protect human bodies that the human rights movement was born. It was rather to protect those uh, capacities of consciousness out of which civilization flows. You know, that extraordinary, and I will stop in just a few minutes, just a few more thoughts, if, if I may. That uh, extraordinary trial that took place that involved Adolf Eichmann, that set us in large part in this kind of discussion. Adolf Eichmann was not tried for the murder and torture of uh, hundreds of thousands of people, nay millions. As heinous a crime as that was, he was not charged with that crime. He was charged with a more subtle crime. <coughs> he was charged with crimes against humanity. He said, the, the, the court said, your way of proceeding threatened the very fabric of uh, human dignity. And uh, <coughs> whatever will happen in the future, we can never allow this to happen again. And so they articulated principles and laws that would protect not only human bodies, but human capacities. In other words, they articulated principles and laws that would protect the ontological status of human beings, the, the human spirit. I could go into uh, a lengthy discussion of this, but I won't. I just would share with you one last observation before we open our, 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 our uh, session to uh, to a discussion. I think that one of the greatest threats to human dignity now is uh, the threat of uh, 
the philosophy of materialism. Materialism as a practice and materialism as a worldview. The Universal House of Justice wrote about the problem of materialism. And if you would allow me to quote the House of Justice. Followed by 19th century European thought, acquiring enormous influence through the achievements of American capitalist culture, and endowed by Marxism with a calculated credibility peculiar to that system. Materialism emerged full-blown in the second half of the 20th century as a kind of universal religion, claiming absolute authority in both the personal and social life of humankind. Its creed was simplicity itself. Reality, including human reality, and the process by which it evolves is essentially material in nature. The goal of human life is or ought to be the satisfaction of material needs and wants. Society exists to facilitate this quest, and the collective concern of humankind should be an ongoing refinement of the system aimed at rendering it ever more efficient in carrying out its assigned tasks. The House of Justice goes on to point out, if leaders of thought were to be candid in their assessment of the evidence readily available, it is here that one would find the root cause of such apparently unrelated problems as the pollution of the environment, economic dislocation, ethnic violence, spreading public apathy, the massive increase in crime, and epidemics that ravage whole populations. A great deal of what my paper does is that it tries to give a kind of a rational account for why the philosophy and doctrine of materialism has proven its own conceptual and pragmatic inefficacy, its own failure. And, uh, I will, uh, I will leave it to, I know. Uh, I was telling my friends uh, last night, uh, as I went prepared to go to bed, that uh, I was really hoping that uh, the conference would be a, a time for us to, to, to reflect together, to talk together, and uh, that we would not weary you with too many ideas, that we would share a few ideas. We would, we would talk to one another. And uh, I think that it's been a real tremendous success. And uh, I'm, I'm just very grateful to, to, to all of you for, for coming in. And I think that it's probably a good idea for us to open up the arena and, and just to have a conversation with one another about some of the themes in the conference. And, uh,